30 and flirty. She makes a wish that she could be cool and have fabulous clothes and a fabulous job and fabulous friends. I want to be 30. And she gets the wish and it catapults us into her 30s. I'd never just been offered anything before. And the story was so solid from beginning to end that I knew I wanted to make a movie like that. It was a little daunting, and I was talking to the rest of the Alias cast about it. And when I said the title, they said, Jennifer, that is so you. You know, here you are, you come in and you're all like serious spy chick. But as soon as they, they say cut, you're totally 13, so you might as well make a living at it for the summer. Stay there for a second. Working with Gary Winnick was one of my favorite things about the whole experience. Okay, ready? I'm going to grade you guys. All right. I've done a couple other larger budget films, and it seems like sometimes you can get lost in the melee of dollies and cranes and whatnot. And he really made it feel small and personal, which was nice. He's not back at the monitor. He's not at Video Village. He's not, like, hidden behind 14 assistants. He's next to the camera. He's watching us. He's talking to us. I've known Gary a long time. Uh, we come from the same kind of New York independent movie scene. I think why the film works so well is because Gary's brought kind of that really great sense of story into a big romantic comedy. I have no idea what it's like to be a 13-year-old girl. But what I can get is wishing and wanting to be something and getting that wish and then realizing, oh my God, like what, you know, it's you, you climb up the ladder to try to get ahead and you, you're like, oh my God, I'm on the wrong ladder. And now you gotta get off the ladder and go up the other ladder to get on, and kind of, that's my life. So I bring that to the movie. Judy Greer, without a doubt, is a comic genius. I saw his thingy. Oh, God, not his thingy. I'm 13! Jenna, if you're gonna start lying about your age, I'd go with 27. She knows how to take something that seems like nothing and spin it or talk about improvising. She always can make a line that seems funny 10 times funnier. Oh, my God, Trisha, things so bad. You had to come to our party to eat some free food. Please put some crab in your purse for later. Every take, there's a different great thing, and it's always hard in the cutting room to pick out what we want to do, because every take, she's doing something different that's equally as funny. He said to feel free to do anything, say anything. Uh, what is this? I don't even know what this is. OK, you can wipe off the doe-eyed Bambi watching her mother get shot and strapped to the back of a van look from your face. Working with Jennifer was so easy. We had so much fun on set. Sometimes we pretended like we were undercover, which was sort of fun, <laughs> like when we had to take the elevators up and down the buildings and stuff. But, um, well, I did it more because I was way into trying to pretend like I was a spy. <laughs> yeah, she, uh, she was very willing to go into spy mode. Very happy to go there with me. Excuse me one second. Lucy? The casting director showed me a picture of Judy Greer and said, you know, this is who we want you to play younger. And I was like, that, that works. She's, she, we look a lot alike. And I met her mom and her mom said that, she's like, oh, it's like seeing my daughter again. And it was really cute. Gary and the producers all thought she looked so much like me, but I think she's so cute. And they were like, did you look just like her when you were her age? And I was like, no, I looked like a little boy. <laughs> and she's gorgeous. Before I even started shooting, they showed us uh, some rough cuts of what they'd shot with the kids. So I saw her and I was like, oh God. And they were telling her to try to do stuff that I would do. And I was like, no, no, I have to do what she does because she was perfect. She hit it right on. Remember, keep that blindfold on. And just so you know, Chris loves going for second base. With Krista, she had never acted before, but there was a certain awkwardness. Uh, about her that was perfect for this role. She has that tall thing going on. Her arms are long, and that is exactly how I was at her age. Exactly, to a T. Just like there was more of me than I knew what to do with, but I was this big, you know? I think I kind of looked like Jennifer when she was younger. I saw a couple of pictures, but they were in black and white, so it was kind of hard to tell, but she said that I kind of looked like her when she was younger. Here's the big secret. You know, I'm not a girl, so I don't know any of this stuff about um, that time, which, of course, is an amazing um, 
sort of thing to think about. I think Gary was kind of uncomfortable um, during the stuffing the bra scenes because I'm a little girl and <laughs> he's an older guy, so it was kind of hard to, for him to explain to me how he wanted me to do the scene without sounding awkward. Oh, Chris. It's not Chris, it's Matt. Sean, it's an interesting thing because I think Sean is actually probably a little too cool, so we put a fat suit on him and we had to actually, I always had to sort of say, okay, you're too cool, you gotta sort of be more awkward. Sorry, Beef had majority rules. You know, he's like a little too smart for the people around him. You're all hopeless people. Freak. Robot. And I thought that was a really good jumping off point for, for Matt. Mark is an out of control, unbelievably amazing actor. Five years ago, if you had said, list three or four actors that you would love to work with, he would have been at the top of my list. God, our first meeting was a rehearsal. It was, it was a read through. You know, we were sitting around a big table with the producers and the cast. It was like, I don't know, 30 people around this table, and her and I are sitting next to each other. And um, we had to play the kids in the reading, and we were trying to get them to let us play the kids, actually, in the movie. And that was being talked about for some time, but then they, you know, they thought maybe that wouldn't work so well. He came up with this wonderful notion about sort of where his character, where the relationship should go. And so this last scene in the film, probably one of the things I'm really most proud of in the movie, and it really sort of brings a whole level of, of, of complexity and heart to this film that I kind of feel like Mark sort of had that instinctual thing even before he read the script. You can't just turn back time. Why not? I moved on. You moved on. We've gone down different paths for so long. We made choices. I I chose Wendy. I just love that that was kind of the, the anti-romantic comedy ending. My balls, excuse my French, are in an iron vice. This character could have easily gone too over too broad. I mean, he is kind of the comic relief in the movie. When Andy came in, he got it. In our discussions, he really wanted, as I wanted, to keep it as grounded as possible. And then he got really into, you know, going to the magazines and seeing how they work, how they dress and all of that. He hit that character so perfectly. I mean, and his, I mean, his wardrobe was insane. It was so beautiful. I wish I was a man so I could have worn his suits and shirts and ties and all of Paul Smith, and it was insanely perfect. And his character was so funny, and I'm assuming he had a great time doing it. Yippee. For me, it's just getting that balance between his kind of flamboyant nature. And is he Arthur or Martha? And, and actually, you know, keeping the reality of who he is and the, and the stress he's under. And for Gary, I, I really totally respect what he's, what he's been doing, although I'm sure he's got frustrated with me and I've kind of gone, oh, God, because he keeps going up to me and going, OK, bring it down, bring it down, just bring it down. That's great. You know, and I, I kind of think, like, I'm doing nothing here, and he's going, bring it down, bring it down. I'm thinking, if I bring it down anymore, I'm going to be lying down, you know? All oh, right, so you're invited, are you? OK, cut. Okay, it's really weird, actually, because having done Gollum for the last, for, you know, ages and ages, I realise my face has got more and more animated, and I, can't, I feel like I make look Jim Carrey look kind of, like, relaxed. No, no, is he gay? Are you gay? Yeah, okay. no. <laughs> Action. Of all the things that she has to go through, some of the funniest situations are what happens when you're with the guy. And so it was funny to have to like put her in these situations where I'm stripping for her and I'm licking her ear and trying to do these things. That's a little more natural if you're 30, but when you're 13, it must be really freaky. It was a lot of fun to shoot. Jennifer is, you know, being from West Virginia and stuff, embarrassed by all of that anyway. So that kind of was fun and I got a chance to embarrass her even more kind of on the set, but Sam is the exact opposite. He was kind of fearless about it, which I think you have to be as an actor for the, to do that scene. Oh, gross! No, wait, gross. Ah, No, I don't want to see that again! Wait! Um. But when we got to the dance part, you know, I didn't know what the hell to, to, 
do, really. Uh, you, know, how, you know, he says, well, how should I do it? And I said, well, give me a couple of variations. And just each one was kind of funnier than the next. Gary was not any help with the dance moves. <laughs> I looked to him for, for that, and he, 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 he offered me nothing. So basically, we went with some imagery. I imagined that I, my arms were two by fours, and my head was an anvil, and just sort of limited my motions around that. And that, that worked well for the first 15 or 20 takes, but then we needed some more, so I started to get Middle Eastern and find these other moves, which at that point it just started to lose all grounding in reality. And that's when Gary got happy, and then we started to find it in that. <sighs> he so went for it. I mean, he must have really stood in front of a mirror and figured out the most, like, looked at the most embarrassing things he could do and just brought them into work. I'd like to hope that she was enjoying it, even though her character was not supposed to be. I caught little flickers of, of possible enjoyment, which, which kept me going, take after take after take. And I was truly, honestly, embarrassed and in hysterics. That was not hard to play at all. It was like, you are not doing that. You are not dancing like that in your tiny wide as you are, you know? <laughs> Wait, I don't want to see that again! <laughs> Nothing was more fun than watching Mark Ruffalo learn to do Thriller. Jennifer, of course, caught on very quickly, and I was like the 4,000-pound gorilla trying to, uh, to learn these moves. I had on five-inch heels, which, you know, normally your typical shoe, this is what, three-inch, four-inch? We're talking five-inch platform heels. And so my concern was to have as much fun as possible and not kill myself. The challenge is we're having like, you know, 200 extras standing around going, man, I could do that better than him. That guy sucks, man, <laughs> you know? I got this call saying, Andy, they want, they want you to do a moon a moonwalk in this. And I was like, well, you know, that takes a little bit of time to do that. But I, someone practiced with me in London, and I spent ages doing the moonwalk, and then turned up on, on, on the first day of dance rehearsals, and it was like everybody knew this routine really well, and I was absolutely crapping myself. Jenna! Filming in New York was crazy. We shot all over the city, up one side of New York and down the other, in the park. I mean, we were everywhere. We were under the Brooklyn Bridge. We were everywhere. And it was hot and sometimes beautiful and crowded. And, you know, sometimes you'd have hundreds of tourists watching. And sometimes you would just have New Yorkers being like, oh, what are you shooting? Who do you think you are? And you kind of feel like, I don't know who we think we are. How embarrassing. When she'd show up on, the, on set, we'd be on, on the corner of, uh, you know, 57th and, and, and 5th Avenue or somewhere. And, and then there'd just be like 100 people standing around. Jenny! You know. Here we are in the middle of Manhattan, and there are hundreds of people watching from across the street of this huge apartment building. And I had to come out of these revolving doors and freak out, basically, and jump up and down and, you know, wave my arms in the air. And all these people are watching. They have no idea what I'm doing or why I'm doing it. And there are all these paparazzi taking pictures, and so it was embarrassing, you know? The paparazzi uh, in New York was kind of a new thing, and I guess you can't kick them out. Like, they can just be in your way, which they were. And then, of course, you know, they're taking pictures of Jennifer every moment they can. We were rehearsing the kiss, and someone realized that it was Jennifer. And then I'm on top of her. And, like, all of a sudden, the cameras are up, and everyone's scrambling around trying to, you know, pick up a piece of cardboard and throw it in front of the camera. I have never been good at clothes. I've never been a clothes horse. With Jenna Rink and with Susie DeSanto, it was like a whole new ball of wax. Jennifer's character has a big character arc and how she changes and realizes who she is and the costumes have to tell that story. Jenna, as an adult, works for a fabulous fashion magazine. These women who work in these places are obsessed with labels. Up to the minute, clothes, like they don't ever wear anything more than one season, which is absurd, actually, <laughs> but these people exist. We acted like cr complete crazed lunatics about the clothes. It was, oh my god, and like that little collar on that shirt, and what about that Marc Jacobs? Oh my god, Marc Jacobs is so Jenna Rink right now. I mean, we were like, I, was, I would look at myself and be like, who am I? What's going on here? <laughs> yeah, but give her something like I get it that handbags cost, can cost three, four thousand dollars. I know that's a lot of money and it's kind of embarrassing to say, but you know, 
not only have I spent that type of money on fashion, but I kind of know that this character would. Okay, let's go again. Great cut. At one Great. point, we were looking at a Dolce & Gabbana jacket, army jacket, and Gary, when it came up, he's like, no, nah, man, you can't wear that. It's Dolce & Gabbana. And Gary, like, knows all these labels. <laughs> he knows it all, you know? Oh, yeah, that's Prada. That, you know, he never would wear that. And so uh, Susie was trying to slide in <laughs> these, like, really nice clothes on me, and he just wouldn't go for it. Yeah. Nailed it. And she starts to kind of, like, realize her friendship with Matt and kind of get in touch with her sweetness and stuff like that. We started using a lot of pink and really pretty soft fabrics that Jenna, as a 13-year-old, would actually okay. pick out. As Jenna starts off on her journey to kind of rediscover who she really is, then Lucy's kind of going in the other direction. I really liked this chartreuse lace shirt that I wore at the restaurant scene when she asks out the young kid. You want to go to jail? I meant that guy. The man? Oh, gross. I loved how that fit, and I loved how it looked, and I loved that she put it with jeans, and it felt really wearable but fashionable. There's a scene in the elevator where Jenna and Lucy are doing a parting of the ways, and um, Jenna has on that soft pink top and that soft pink suede jacket, and Lucy's got on black and red, and so it's just kind of like a difference in the two looks. The 80s part of the movie was challenging in a way because the clothes are so different than what we wear now. And so what was challenging was trying to find a look for the six chicks that was really cute and also that had sort of a fun and contemporary appeal to it so that young girls watching the movie would also think that it was really a great look. I would like to know how they felt wearing those clothes. I bet they felt crazy wearing them, but it looked so natural to me, you know? They all only wear hoop earrings, polka dots or stripes, acid wash denim, and high tops with different colored shoelaces. But Jenna doesn't have any tennis shoes that are cool enough to wear, so she wears like her dress-up shoes. She just totally misses the boat. That was what the story was to tell with the costumes. It was like almost a vacation for her. And I think she was excited to play and have a good time. And I think she really liked the clothes and dressing like a girl, you know? Yeah, it was. It was really liberating to feel like I was smiling on screen. And that was one of the weirdest things when I watched the movie, is that I've, I've never seen myself smile so much in something. She's just, uh, you know, an unbridled movie star, you know, just waiting to, to blast out into the world. And this is, this is going to do it for her, I think, you know, in a very big way. That's great, guys. Really great. I had a great time making this movie. Jennifer and I always say that we don't know if another movie will ever have this great experience again. And I don't know if it's because it's like her first sort of starring role in a big feature and my first directing role in a big feature. But whatever it was, we had an amazing time. I hope that I have other experiences that have been as positive from beginning to end as this one has been.